Good morning. Welcome to the Henry Block School. My name is John Norton. I'm the managing director of the Rainier Institute here, and it's my honor to welcome you to the first time we've ever hosted Million Cups. Uh, so, welcome. Uh, for those of you who are visiting for the first time, uh, let me point you to some uh, resources first. Um, would the faculty and staff that are here uh, sort of stand up and wave or do something exotic? Okay, these guys, find, find one of these guys at the end of the show and uh, they'll give you a guided tour of the building and you can look around and see all the stuff. It's a pretty exciting space for us. We occupied it in, uh, in August. Um, let's see, I, wanna, I need to make one real brief announcement. This sheet that advertises the Rainier Venture Creation Challenge that will happen this spring, this challenge is open to students at all Missouri and Kansas universities. So if you know guys at KU or K-State or uh, wherever uh, that want to participate in this, uh, total prize money right now is uh, $75,000, but we're raising more, so those of you that want to participate and contribute to that amount, um, I have a hat that I can pass around, and uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, so throw a couple of extra 100,000 in there would be really nice. Um, I'm gonna introduce George Brooks now. We'll get right to the program. George, if you would perform the introductions for us. All right, welcome guys. Um, so I'm used to making this, it's uh, obviously at Coffin Foundation, but we're so excited. Well, that was weird, it like immediately got clear. Um, I'm so excited to be over here at the new school, the Block School, and, and we're just very honored that they allowed us to have this. From what I hear, next year's gonna be a really big part of them being a part of One Million Cups, and we're excited about what that's gonna look like. I know that's kind of secretive to a little extent, but so I'll, I'll let that happen as it happens. So. Um, so what is One Million Cups? Oh, first off, this is a little bittersweet for me because actually today is my last time introing um, our entrepreneurs. Oh, thanks guys, that was perfect. <laughs> that was perfect. Um, no, we're really excited and we'll get into that more, but we're gonna be making some transitions end of year, new faces, and I'll still definitely be around being a part of the community because that's what we're here for. But um, this is the transition, right? This is, this is the last, last one of the year, last one for me, and we're at a new place. This is exciting. So what is One Million Cups? One Million Cups is an educational program that allows entrepreneurs to come together around a figurative or literal One Million Cups of coffee to create a community that we can learn from each other. So each week, every week except for during the holidays. I think that's the only time we ever take a break. But each week we get together and we have two entrepreneurs present their ideas. They get two or six minutes to present and then 20 minutes of Q&A. So that means that you as a room, as a community of entrepreneurs supporting the entrepreneurs up here, have to ask them questions during that Q&A time. So they get six minutes of Q&A, we take a break in between, make a few announcements, and then we do the next one. So, what this allows us to do is to form a community around learning about what else is happening in our community. Um, figuring out how to help each other through the same exact struggles that we all deal with. Um, starting companies and running them and scaling them and God willing making money off them. And uh, so well, that's what we're here to do is to support each other. Um, what else? We've got Twitter handles, at One Million Cups KC. Uh, if you want to talk about what's going on today and even talk about us outside of today, that's great. We love that. At One Million Cups in general, without the KC is the national handle, but at One Million Cups KC is the Kansas City handle. And I'll let Nate get into that more because he's actually presenting today, but um, we are really excited that we're in 20 plus. I'm just going to, at this point, it's like a lot of cities around the nation. Uh, we're in 20 plus cities around the nation and only looking to grow more and he'll talk more about that. So first up, so Landon, Landon, I had a chance to meet Landon and this was at One Million Cups, gosh, a year ago, a little less than a year ago. My first week in Kansas City. And Landon was at the back of the room, I had no idea who this guy was except that he had good hair and was well dressed. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, you know what, I like that. And so, um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so anyways, I walked up to him and he was so passionate to tell me about his idea for how he didn't only want to start a business, but he really wanted to change lives. And I thought that was such an incredible story. I'm blessed to have him now as not only a part of this community um, of entrepreneurs, but we also go to the same church together. And we really formed a relationship with our family. So that's just an honor to be able to present him today. I do want to put, throw out one little um, plug that they are doing a concert this Friday. Is a, is a benefit to raise money for their program as they're growing and scaling. Uh, I know some of the artists playing there. It's going to be a phenom phenomenal night of Christmas music and jazz, and it's, it's going to be cool. I'm, I'm yeah. really excited about it. Check out their Indiegogo um, campaign, or you can buy tickets, I think, on Ticket, Ticketmaster. No. Give, givecreative.org. Givecreative.org, even better. That's simpler. Givecreative.org. And today um, only, really, they do have a match. So up to a certain amount, um, your money's being doubled for any donations that go to um, actually supporting that concert this Friday. So hopefully you can come and check it out with us. But without further ado, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Landon Young. Thank you. We said we were going to hug. We said we were going to hug. We did. Oh. <laughs> there it is. Thanks. All right, so this is going to be a little different format uh, for those who have been before. This is going to be a story, and I'm going to kind of rush through it, so feel free to ask lots of questions at the end. Um, six months ago, I sat across the table, um, just like this, with my wife, and I said, here in two weeks, we're bankrupt. Um, I have no idea what we're going to do. I, I don't have a plan to even have any money in two weeks, um, but what I do have, thank you Tom, what I do have is, is a vision. Um, what I do have is an idea of how I can help people uh, in developing countries help themselves and empower them. Um, and we looked at each other and I said, you know what, I think it has to be in Kansas City. Um, and she looked at me and said, I don't know how we're going to do it, but let's do it. So. We packed everything that we had into a U-Haul, and we traveled the 10 hours across the country to Kansas City. Um, with no money, we took out a loan just to get here. And, uh, and this is that story of World Help Solutions and my one year at Kaufman. But before I go into that, I want to talk about um, me uh, and where I come from. So this is me at Purdue University uh, about a year ago. I was studying ecological science and engineering, uh, water quality and how it relates to production agriculture in developing countries. And I heard about this thing called the Kaufman Global Scholars Program. And I had the opportunity to apply. Uh, I heard back that I had uh, <clears throat> an interview. And when I pulled up the Skype screen, this is what I saw. Uh, <laughs> And uh, as well as Nancy Thomas from the Kaufman Foundation and Nate. And I thought, if the Kaufman Foundation as a whole is anything like these two individuals, it's something I want to be a part of. Um, they, uh, they heard about my, my story and what I had done in Sub-Saharan Africa around clean water and agriculture. And, um, and they offered me a chance to be a part of the program. Um, so I told my wife, um, who was 38 weeks pregnant at the time with our second child, um, that I had this crazy idea to go to Kansas City. And of course she said, no. And the next day she woke up and said, you know what, it's what I've said you should do your, your whole life. It's what I've been telling you. I think you should do it. I don't know how we're going to, but, um, but we are. So I traveled to Kansas City, and this was in January. This was one year ago. I joined 12 other entrepreneurs from around the world, the UK, the Netherlands, Singapore, China, and the United States. Um, Kaufman afforded us the opportunity to learn from entrepreneurs and educators. Uh, Boston, Chicago, Silicon Valley, uh, we were just meeting amazing people. Um, this is uh, Google. Um, we just hung out with just incredible people um, and learned so much. We also got a chance to intern in a high growth company. Mine was water.org here in town, uh, founded by Matt Damon and Gary White. And everyone always asks, did you get to work with Matt Damon? Well, I'll let the photos speak for themselves. Um, <laughs> But, but what I did do, um, I, I, learned, I learned a lot and had an advisor say, you know, you you've have all this stuff you've done over the last few years. You should do a soft restart and form a company around this uh, and start meeting some of these problems. So that's what we did. Uh, I took the lessons I had learned at Kaufman, um, namely, find a migraine sort of problem um, 
kind of around lean methodologies, under promise and over deliver, and make sure you're managing expectations. And these are all incredibly difficult things to do, and here's how they relate to our company, World Help Solutions. So we find migraine problems. We went to the largest Methodist church in the country here in Leewood, the Church of the Resurrection, and we said, here's what we do around water and agriculture. What do you think? And they said, that's pretty neat, uh, but we need medical tools. Can you do that? And we said, yes. So we pivoted, and one month later, literally four weeks later, we had a device in Malawi uh, working. Uh, this is a local healthcare worker named Mercy who is uh, triaging patients. Um, we went through a series of iterations. We told them, this goes to my next point, under promise and over deliver. So I went to Charity Water and, and kind of did the same thing with them. Um, and they said, yes, we love what you're doing. We need this. And I said, that's awesome, but we don't have a solution yet. And it was really embarrassing. Um, it's kind of when lean goes wrong, kind of a thing, you know. Um, but with Church of the Resurrection, I said, it's going to be a 90% failure up front. And hopefully by March, we will have something that's 90% right. And uh, we've already exceeded those expectations. But it, from the get-go, we told them, we need to iterate this thing. We're going to learn. We're going to develop over time. Um, and they were extremely flexible. Um, and because the need they had was so great, they were willing to work with us. Managing expectations. Um, I've seen so many people come to One Million Cups and present and say, I had this wonderful idea, and we have went through um, so many iterations. We're driving our developers crazy. Our clients don't know what to expect. Um, and this kind of shows, you know, here's what the customer explained in the top left. Um, here's what they actually needed down here. They feel like they were billed for this. Um, and here's how it was supported, you know. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's true. Managing all of those expectations is really difficult to do. Uh, and we've had some wonderful advisors and mentors along the way uh, who have helped us with um, high quality requirements documentation and design documentation um, that's alleviated some of those pains. Um, and we could not have done this without them. So again, lessons learned. Find migraine problems in the world, not just the kind of little problems, but the ones that are waking people up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and crying. Um, the kind of problems the woman who we're trying to help in, in Malawi, whose child is literally dying. That's a migraine sort of problem, and that's what we're interested in solving. Um, we're not there. Uh, we're working on it. We're making strides. Um, but we're pretty excited about where we've come and where we're going. So. Here's an overview of, of World Help Solutions in the last six months since it was formed. Uh, went through the Kauffman program, found that sort of migraine problem, moved my family to Kansas City, started the new entity, iterated around six times in Malawi and Haiti and um, Liberia, launched in five countries. We've had uh, around $100,000 in revenue, and we've made some incredible friends. Um, and we have a lot more opportunities coming up um, in the next few weeks. Today, I'd like to announce publicly that we have a water tool. This is my baby. Uh, Diana Kander would say, be careful, it's not an ugly baby. It's not. Um, I've been working on this for several years. It's proprietary. It's three years of engineering research into this tool that helps local people make decisions in the field about what water solution is best for them, what filter, what purifier, based on their local conditions. Um, I think it will revolutionize the way that missions are done um, and the way that aid is done around clean water. But the goal is to empower young people like this, the future entrepreneurs who are going to be making decisions in their own communities. We want to phase ourselves out of the process. We want this to be sustainable long term. So this is my family. We are here in K KC now and we are happy. Um, I, do, uh, I was recently accepted a position at William Jewell College. I'm Director of Creativity and Innovation there. Um, it allows me to continue doing the things that I love. Um, and thank you to all who have helped. Everyone who has had any part in this, could you raise a hand really quickly? I know there's a concentration over here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, there's been a huge, um, a huge amount of help from the One Million Cups community and from the Kaufman community. Um, I just want to say thank you. And with that, done. Thank you, George.
All right, so this is the point where you guys get to ask questions. So raise your hand and I'll, we'll try to get a mic to you so we can hear. Landon, walk us through how you make money. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> so um, the short answer is we're still figuring that out as you and I talked about this morning. Um, but the way that it's been so far is that uh, we offer licenses. Uh, what is known is that we offer a one-time license, that we have ongoing maintenance fees, and that we have products and services uh, around these tools. We offer the base tools for free. We want anyone to be able to do these things in the field. Uh, but it's the heavy-duty work, the data analytics, uh, it's the sexy dashboards. Those are the things that, um, that's where the real power is, the predictive power, the analytical power, and that's what we charge um, NGOs for. Question over here. So you talked about managing expectations. Given the huge need for clean water in uh, third world countries, how do you manage your own expectations? How do, you, hmm. um, how do you come to grips with the fact that you can't help everyone? Yeah. Um, that's a great question, and that's a really tough question. Um, I'm making the biggest dent in the universe that I can, which is a small den. Um, we're part of uh, a stream of other people who are trying to do the same thing, um, who we work with. Um, in my mind, and lots of you will cringe at this, I'm sure, but in my mind, we don't have competitors. Uh, we have other providers. Um, the goal is to help as many people as possible. Um, and the need for clean water, for food, for medical care is not going away anytime soon, and the resources for those things are not going away anytime soon. Um, so I can only help the people who I can connect with. Um, you know, at the end, you always ask, how can we help you? And um, help me connect to more people. We're just trying to help as many people go from dying to surviving as possible. Um, we're not optimizing up here. We're just trying to help as many people down here. Landon, question for you right here in the front. Yeah. Could you uh, describe what it, what's your inner or core value that's kind of driving you to do this kind of work? That's a great question. Um, thank you. I love people, and I always have. I am naturally someone who will give of myself without expecting anything. Um, I've never, I've never taken any money from World Help Solutions, not because I can't. Um, I've just chosen not to. I've found other ways to make money. Um, I, it's not about me. Uh, none of this is about me. Um, it's, uh, it's about the little girl who I met at the well in Uganda. Um, it's, it's about her. Sorry, I think I'd cry. Um, being at a well and seeing her with her little bottle and the outside of the bottle says oil can and on the inside there's mold on the side of it and she doesn't know and she just smiles at me and um, asks me why I'm there and I just say because I care about her um, and that's true I really do care so, yeah I got a question here. Yeah. Morning, Landon. So, at eight hey, years, Bob. I taught uh, department joint interagency and multinational operations at Fort Leavenworth Staff College, where we talked about how DOD works with NGOs like yours or other agencies to set the conditions so that the Department of Defense doesn't have to go in there in the first place or they don't have to go back when they leave. Yeah. What's your experience in working with agencies, Department of Defense, USAID, Secretary of State, and so on? Yeah, so when I was at, uh, when I was at water.org, um, what I was doing there is, is consulting on multiple use water systems and long-term solutions. Um, whenever organizations go in, whether that's the government or an NGO or a nonprofit, um, the best thing that they can do is empower local people with knowledge, um, with, with tools, um, with materials to sustain themselves and their community and their vision long-term. Um, so that's, that's part of the, the tool that we've built around water, and that's what we're doing with medical and food. 
Um, so, setting up local committees of people, empowering them as quickly as possible, and and giving giving letting go of control as quickly as possible, and fostering. Um, because you have local entrepreneurs, you have local thought leaders, you have um, amazing people who you're, you're, not, uh, you're not the Western savior going in. I mean, they, they have hope, they have skills, and uh, sometimes they just need that little acceleration, you know. Um, that's, that's where we should head. Landing question for you back here. Yeah. Uh, so I'm still not 100% sure what exactly you're organization or what your product is? Can you kind of clear that up for me? Sure. At its core, we have a platform that allows you to uh, collect information. Uh, we can present content. That could be educational content, for instance. Um, and then we collect all of the data, uh, every interaction with the device, every bit of data that's input. And we, we analyze that and then present it back. Uh, we also have um, weighted algorithms that allow you to build decision support tools. And the way that we're applying that is in the needs that we're seeing first and in the pain points that we see first. Um, so that's water, medical, and food. Um, so for water, that's a decision support tool. Based on your local conditions, what sort of water purifier do you need? What would be best suited for you? And then here's educational content we'll provide you based on that, that choice that you've made. Um, here's how you build it. Here's how you um, have a community framework around maintaining it long term so in two years when it goes bad, your community doesn't fall into disrepair. Um, and here are other systems to build around it so when one part fails, there's redundancy. Um, does that answer your question? Another question here in the middle. You answered part of my question too when you're answering John's back there, but part of the thought of what are you in the sense of working with the local groups, like you said, to have that local group set up, how do they connect to you? I mean, is it uh, satellite or just, is it? Great question. From a yes. net network view. Yeah, so all of our tools run completely offline. Uh, they have to because of where we work. Um, more people have cell phones than toilets now. Um, so you'll, I'm not joking, you'll go in the middle of nowhere and someone will pull out, a, a, out of their grass skirt a, a simple cell phone. I mean, it's a simple cell phone. They can do SMS. Um, and, and that's the answer, is through those, that network of simple phones and SMS messaging, um, we can use the tools that we have, smartphones, tablets, or even simple phones, to relay questions and surveys and, and update with information. Landing question for you over here. Yeah. Follow up to your no competitors but other providers. What are you doing to work with Rotary International, who has a major impact in the water area? Have you worked with them? Uh, we've spoken with Rotary. Uh, one of my good friends at water.org is involved at, at Rotary. And um, we've been approached by Rotary around clean water. Um, but it's, it's nothing that we've carried forth until now. We're still just in conversations. But I would welcome any connections that you have there or any suggestions. Thank you. Question here? Yeah. Landon, have you looked at uh, Kiva or any of the other micro lending uh, infrastructures that would have uh, those entrepreneurs, those, uh, those, in those, um, in those communities that would be best suited to kind of deliver and um, take over what you already have in place? Yes, um, not Kiva, um, but others who do micro lending. Um, water.org does around, I mean, they do millions of dollars in micro lending every year through their water credit program. Um, we've built a dashboard um, around that. Um, and there is another, another group um, that we are working with um, that I can talk about after this. Um, yeah, micro lending is huge. There are also issues with micro lending. So um, it's, it's, yeah. I, I can talk to you, with you about that afterwards. Thanks. Landon, question for you over here. Yeah. 
I so love what you're doing and your spirit. Let's talk about water philosophy and arid land. If you were the king of the world, are there certain parts of the world that we should just move the people to where the water is? I mean, I'm from Kansas. We've been through the, the Dust Bowl. We have farmers in western Kansas uh, that are dying. They're losing their family farms because they cannot irrigate their crops. Then there's all the crappy land that America gave the Indians. You know, what, what is, your, if you were the advisor to the world leaders, what would you say? Are there certain solutions you cannot even provide and we should just relocate people? So relocation of people is a huge cultural issue. Um, and you're not going to do it except by force. Um, even in the worst places, people are connected to land. Um, they, they work with the land. Most of us don't, but the majority of the world does. They're connected to their local culture and customs and the landscape and geography. And, and to take them away from that um, is a travesty in many situations. What I would suggest um, are different methods of water use and of agriculture. Um, and that's a long, long discussion that I could have and would love to have. That's my background. So. We've got time for one more question over here. Uh, how do you plan to get exponential growth? Because you have a huge, huge problem. You have a huge, huge problem. Uh, it, it seems to me that if you would locate entrepreneurs in Africa, for example, mm -hmm. which is the, uh, it's huge, and teach them how to teach others and create a business. Yeah. And if you could replicate that a hundred or a thousand times, the problem would go away. Right, and that's what we're doing with medical, so I can maybe draw this really quickly. Um, so, uh, with Church of the Resurrection, um, with medical education, they're traveling community to community, um, providing education. At the same time, they're inspiring local people to want to be the educator. Um, on our device, we have hundreds and, and hundreds of PDFs and, and videos and audio um, that we, we can educate people on through USAID certification um, website. Then once they're ready, they can go into a major city where there is internet at an internet cafe and, and become certified as an instructor um, around certain health topics. Um, I think the same sort of model can work for, for other things, like entrepreneurship. Um, I think, I think um, that is the way to make it exponential because these people who are then trained, then they go off to communities, right, and inspire uh, the next level. Okay, so that's all the time we have for today, but um, as if you've been to One Million Cups before, you know that we always wrap up with the question of how can we as a community, which is what we're here to do, how can we help and support you? Yes. Um, so exponential growth. Uh, it's connecting with organizations. Um, what we have is, is open. I mean, we have some level of what we do that's free to anyone, and I want to provide it. Um, so just connect me with them. Um, also, uh, yeah, we have the, the Benefit co concert coming up. Share it with your friends. We'll be talking about what we do. Um, any way that you can spread the word on what we're doing, yeah, the better. The more we will learn, uh, the more people we'll be connected with. Thank you. All right, great job. Thank you, Lena. I'm impressed every week by the entrepreneurs and the things that are going on in Kansas City. So, absolutely incredible. Um, is Matthew Marcus around? He's got an announcement for us about Kansas City Startup Village. Hello, uh, Matthew here with the Kansas City Startup Village. Question, who here has ever tripped on an uneven or cracked sidewalk? Yes, lots of people. Well, we've got a lot of those over in the village. One of the things that we're really uh, trying to do is you know, support the uh, community that we're in. So we wanted to think of a way that we could do a win-win-win for everybody involved. So we're having a, a fundraiser where we're selling Kansas City Startup Village t-shirts uh, for 20 bucks with all proceeds going to a project uh, to help fix some sidewalks in the Kansas City Startup Village in the Spring Valley uh, neighborhood. Uh, it's, it's a 75-25 
uh, split. So the unified government of Wyandotte County is providing 75% of the funds to fix the sidewalks. We're doing the other 25%. So if you're interested in supporting, we would love it. Uh, the booster goes until December 31st, and I will write up the uh, URL. It's booster.kcsv.org. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. So today is also my last day to be able to introduce uh, the next presenter for you guys. But I have the distinct honor. <laughs> thank you, George. <laughs> um, I have the distinct honor of introducing the man, the myth, the legend, Nate Olson, the founder of One Million Cups, well, co-founder, but really the namesake of who's been really running it and keeping things going on the national level. So give him a big round of applause. I know he's super nervous to talk in front of you all. Go get him, man. Is this on? Okay. I made my slide deck at like 2 a.m., so it's a little zany. Um, I'm going to try and stick to the original format or else I'd be a hypocrite, so uh, go. Okay. Start the clock, yeah. Um, so I graduated from Rockhurst University. I was not a kangaroo. It was a hawk. Uh, I thought this, this should be their new billboard. Uh, <laughs> but um, I graduated in December of 2011 and uh, started working at this place, Coffin Foundation. And uh, I was hired into Kansas City Entrepreneurship uh, largely without a job description, and myself and Cameron Cushman, our job was to create the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of entrepreneurs that we could. Uh, the problem was that at the time, we only knew five entrepreneurs. Um, <laughs> these are all Google Images, okay? So uh, some of them are in this room, but uh, you got Toby Rush, uh, Tim Sylvester, Kirk Hazenzall, Nate Allen, and Mike Farmer. Um, actually the first five presenters of uh, at One Million Cups and essentially <laughs> we're solving our own problem here that as the world's largest nonprofit dedicated to advancing entrepreneurship and education we only knew like five entrepreneurs we were new in this space huge issue right like how do you help entrepreneurs if you don't know who they are and where they're at uh, it's a big problem um, in the midst of all this, I had, I, I'm a big fan of giving credit where credit's due. Um, this is Seth Kravitz. Uh, he wrote a blog post called Technori, uh, or at Technori, which was uh, one of his startups, called A Million Cups. And he's got a great quote here. It says, a true community is built upon a million cups of coffee or pints of beer, a million meaningful interactions between people in which all sides walk away feeling they were heard, learned something, and built a meaningful bridge. So in other words, he was saying, that community is not built upon awards dinners, nights out, um, networking events. The community is really built on one-on-one -on -one meaningful interactions. And at the time, that just wasn't happening in Kansas City. When you start looking at some of the startup hubs that are prized for being amazing places to start businesses, Boston, San Francisco, New York City, Seattle, Portland, Austin, you kind of go through the top 10, and then there's everyone else that you never hear about, right? So like entrepreneurs must not exist there, right? No, <laughs> great ideas live everywhere. And there's, uh, I, the majority of the great ideas in this country don't live in the valley. They live in places like Kansas City and Des Moines, Iowa and Bismarck, North Dakota. And that's kind of what started to happen. So we started One Million Cups. You guys are all here, and um, you've experienced the program. Raise your hand if you're here for the first time. All right, okay, so maybe you haven't experienced the program. So <laughs> each week, we have local entrepreneurs present. They get six minutes to talk about their business, take 20 minutes of Q&A, and at the end, we ask them, what can we do as a community to help you? Um, in Kansas City alone, we've done over 200 entrepreneurs. Who would have thought that Kansas City had 200 startups? And we're still going. We're still going. And it's, it's amazing because uh, going back, back here uh, with the five entrepreneurs that we actually knew at the time, either this was going to be a short-lived program, uh, an experiment that no one would talk about, or we were going to find more entrepreneurs. Um, 
So this year's really been focused on growth, and I want to skip over kind of all the boring stuff that I talk about. We're in 23 cities right now. Um, thanks. Uh, you know, I didn't say this, but in my, in, in my first slide, the, the reason why I said I graduated from Rockers in 2011 is I've never built anything before, which means I've had all of the pains of a first-time entrepreneur, um, not knowing which way is the right direction or, you know, what decision to make and how best to do this. So when my boss came to me and said, okay, scale it, well, what the hell does that mean? Um, <laughs> So anyway, in January, we were in Kansas City, Des Moines, and uh, we've now scaled to uh, 23 cities in about 10 months, 11 months. And the way that we've been doing that is through a franchise model. And um, I love what Landon was saying about managing expectations. And uh, one of the things that I, that I think I did right is in January, we did a, an A test, a B test, and a C test to see the best way to scale the program. So in Des Moines, we partnered with local entrepreneurs, just independent group of entrepreneurs to run the program. B-Test was in Houston. We partnered with a nonprofit, um, and that came with its own you know, benefits, but it also had its own struggles as well. And then in St. Louis, which was uh, our third test, we partnered with a nonprofit and then tried to transition to entrepreneurs. And uh, B and C were, were uh, not, they didn't work in the way that we wanted to because there was so much like nonprofit presents one million cups. It's, it's justification of the program. And we didn't want that. We really think that one million cups works best when we work with independent groups of entrepreneurs. So that's what, that's what we've done. In fact, we had our first organizer summit and I, I was gonna say, I'm just gonna say it, when I was making this slide, I was going to say, One Million Cups organizers are fucking awesome, because they are. <laughs> a lot of you guys don't know this, but John and George, over the last year, have, have volunteered about 500 hours of their time. That's, five, that's better than cash. 500 hours of their brains and smarts apiece have gone into running this program locally and influencing the program. And it takes extremely dedicated entrepreneurs, extremely passionate individuals, and people who get the larger vision of what community can do for entrepreneurs. Um, so they are fucking awesome. Um, I'm not going to go to this. This is our website, and I figured if I try and click on it, I'll break something. So. Um, what we do and the way that we've done this is we partner with really awesome entrepreneurs that want to run this program in their community. Um, and we give them a tool set. So they are part of 1millioncups.com. If you go to the website, there's over 23 cities on there. And it's really a glimpse into that startup community. So if you go to 1 Million Cups Orlando, you can see which startups are presenting each week, where it's at, you can get directions. You can apply to present there if you want. Uh, in fact, you can, if you've, I'll talk about this in a minute, but if you've presented here in Kansas City, you can present anywhere else around the country. Um, it's part of the value we're trying to create. So anyway, we have this tool set, and this hasn't existed before because who would have known what the entrepreneur, or who the entrepreneurs were in Kansas City before we started doing this? How would you know who the entrepreneurs are, who are the uh, community organizers, and what's really going on? in places like Reno, Nevada, or San Diego. There just isn't an infrastructure for that, so we've built that. Um, you can check out our website, or I'll show it in the Q&A. Um, so there's a huge demand for what we're doing. We're basically giving away free ice cream in places that don't have ice cream. Um, <laughs> the red dots are places that want us right now, that have gone through our application process. There's over 70 cities, um, including global, globally, and um, uh, to be perfectly honest, this scares the shit out of me because <laughs> something, I, we're like maybe two full time employees for this entire thing and about 80 volunteers right now. And um, I mean, it's just, just, I'm being real with you guys. Like, this is really cool, but if we were a real startup, we would have been broken already. I mean, we would have gone under. And you can't say no because if you say no, you create your own natural competitors. We already have people that are copying the program, using our trademark in other places that haven't been approved. We have people that just rip off the program and call it something else. 
And so we have to say yes and figure it out, which I'm sure a lot of you guys do. And, um, okay, so I, <laughs> these are weird taglines. I'm going to explain some of them, but I want to talk about my dream. And I say it's my dream because it's really, it may or may not happen, and it may or may not be in line with the organization that I represent. Um, but this is my dream for One Million Cups. I'm running out of time. So empower E's and L's. Um, I want to empower entrepreneurs everywhere to be the leaders in their community, to be the change that they want to see. Um, that's been probably the most humbling thing is going to a community and being like, hey, you would be an amazing organizer for this program. And they're like, me? Really? Me? And I'm like, yes. Here. Here's everything. Go forth and prosper. And they've done amazing things. Um, I think that empowerment, once they launch programs, um, we've got the crew from Springfield here, so um, we're growing this program and we want to create safe educational spaces. I was talking to Melissa, we were having a, we were at Vietnam Cafe yesterday, I'm like really nervous for this presentation. She's like, this is the nicest crowd you're ever going to present to. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, you're right, it's, this is a safe educational space. Um, and then getting into the meat of it, what One Million Cups is doing, we are creating an intervention point between the entrepreneurs and their community. At its most basic level, we have an invested interest in helping the entrepreneurs in our community. That's what Ewing Kaufman was all about. That's what Mr. K's dream was, is how do we help entrepreneurs be successful? And if they do that, if we give them the right tools, the right education, then they will create jobs, they'll create economic impact in our community, and entrepreneurs create the things that we didn't even know we wanted, you know? That's kind of the amazing thing, is they're solving problems that we didn't really even knew were problems. And so we're creating an intervention point, and that's why we ask, what can we do as a community to support you? Because then the entrepreneur is not sharing the, or not, you know, taking the entire burden it's now on us as a, community to, as a community to help them. And I think that's the biggest point is if that company you know, doesn't work out, which 90% of startups aren't going to work out, that's okay. What happens next to them? You know, like how can we continue to intervene? Geometry. Uh, basically, <laughs> what I meant by this is if I can change an entrepreneur's trajectory like 1%, maybe that's, yeah, 1% through this program, where the entrepreneur meets and everything. That, that's really not that much right now. Hey, Nate, I've got a question. Come on, dude, I'm in the middle of teaching. Well, you've done a good job. It is typical one million fashion. You are quite a bit over six minutes. <laughs> And okay, sure we passed the, the mug already. This, hold on, <laughs> let me finish this thought and I'll wrap up. <laughs> All right. He does kind of lead, so. Please. All right, you're just, you're just burning time now. Um, if we can change an entrepreneur's trajectory by 1%, let's say they have one meaningful interaction that leads to another coffee, that like, it doesn't really do that much right now, but like three years from now, that's a meaningful gap. And that's really what I mean by that, is if we can change their trajectory and their growth, then that would be awesome. Um, I'm just gonna stop now. Uh, I guess I give up. <laughs> um, but if you guys are okay with it, I wanna share two quick stories, and then I'll be done. <laughs> yeah? No? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Boy, I bet you want some examples, don't you? <laughs> um, okay. Well, so anyway, we have one million cups in 23 cities right now. I think, you know, um, with the help of my team at the foundation, um, who knows where we'll be. Basically, our scale set is, uh, our, our tool set, sorry, is scalable now. So any city that wants one million cups can go through the application process and we can get it to them. So we're no longer hindered by our ability to scale. So Cali, I had to go see this. Cali was one of our guinea pigs for the passport program. We said, you know, 
Callie, she's got Roxy's, you know, I don't know if you've seen her presentation, but she's an awesome entrepreneur. She sells her um, raw vegan food product in 100 retail locations in Kansas City. In Kansas City, Missouri, the education for raw vegan products is so much higher than it would be in a market like Denver. So we said, hey, why don't you go present at One Million Comes Denver? Um, that was on a Wednesday. She called me on a Friday and said, hey, I just sold into four more Whole Foods in Denver, and now Denver is just crushing it right now and becoming a huge market. So her presenting in another location has actually been tremendous for her business, and we've created the pathway for that. Some of you guys might remember Ron from a few weeks ago. Ron is from Orlando. He's one of our community organizers. World Housing Solutions. He's got you know, houses that can be assembled in, uh, in a day. And I can't say who he met at One Million Cups, but it's a big deal. If you remember, he was talking about his question, or a question from the audience was, um, FEMA, why don't, why don't you sell this product to FEMA and work with them? He's like, it's like talking to a, you know, this is what it's like talking to FEMA. Well, he's now got an end to FEMA and he wrote me this long thank you letter, but there was someone at One Million Cups who knew someone who is now making that introduction and changing his life and his trajectory of his business. Um, so final thing is, okay, that's my vision. This is a great program. You know, we're, we're hitting some milestones, but would this be in line with Ewing Kaufman's vision for his foundation and what he wanted his work to go to? This is um, a teacher at TCU that visited One Million Cups in Dallas uh, just a few weeks ago who was hired by Mr. K and knew him personally. And he said that Mr. K would have loved this program. And that's what's really gratifying about it. So anyway, here's our team. <laughs> Ask me questions. <laughs> Six minutes is hard. Six minutes is a rough one. Why'd we do that? We got a question for you up here. Morning, Nate. So franchising, I'm glad you used that example because as franchises grow, they have to set rules. Like you can't go to Burger King, you're not gonna get rice and waffles, you're gonna get a Whopper. So how are you managing that growth with making sure they don't dilute your brand? Like perhaps uh, cronyism in selecting who presents or perhaps like taking up the entire time and not leaving time for questions? <laughs> Gee whiz, you guys. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, Nathan Kurtz here in the front um, started working at the Coffin Foundation. He's been awesome with helping scale this and focus on operations. So basically when it comes down to managing and, and oversight of the program, we have to have critical control points along the way. Um, our process in the past has been too focused on hand-holding and saying, okay, this is how you do it, come watch us. We've finally built a tool set where we can say, here's the playbook, read it. Here's frequently asked questions. Here's our tool set and how to use it. Go forth and prosper. But we also kind of create a buddy system. We launch, uh, we like to launch cities in pairs. Um, it's actually kind of funny because there's a, there is a large customer service part of all this. They're, you're working with volunteers. And when you can't manage all of that, I was like, I can't manage all these one-off things. And so I started launching cities in pairs because I was like, hey, this is, like, if you have questions, call your sister city. <laughs> That's just my way of not having to be customer service all the time. Um, but it's proven to be a really good model that there's, the community sort of heals itself, the community sort of, um, uh, keeps itself in line, which is kind of neat. And uh, we also have oversight on our back end to make sure that people are doing everything that we ask of them. So um, our entrepreneurs that present have to go through the educational process that we require of them or else their logo doesn't go on the website. So we have built that into the system that they have to meet our, our minimums to um, go on the website. So we've just placed critical control points through the entire process, and to be honest, we're still, you know, we're still correcting. We're still, we have to do that, but largely a lot of our sites, you know, don't really waver from the program. And we also have legal documents as well. <laughs> More questions? Nate, Tracy has a question for you. Oh, hey. I love this. Ask me about the brand. 
Where did the name come from? <laughs> hey, good name. Good name. I like it. And I love this church of the startup, and I love the part about a safe space, because it is like a kinder, gentler version of Shark Tank. So that people are getting coached early and lovingly, yeah. hopefully. Is there, sp I mean, hopefully the fire marshal is not coming in here or you're about to outgrow the space at, at the Kaufman. Is there room for another One Million Cups chapter like in Johnson County at, that would meet at a different time? I'm, you know, they talked about Church of the Resurrection. They started satellite churches. You know? Great question. Um, I totally, yeah, there's a lot of interest in um, Olathe, Johnson County, to start another One Million Cups. But it's sort of the antithesis of what we're trying to do, which is create density of entrepreneurs. Um, we, you know, why reinvent the wheel? It takes a lot of work to make this happen, you guys. And so we have groups around the city and around the country that live stream our events. And we have people that participate on the live stream and, you know, um, me otherwise, but if we were going to do one in the city, I think the only one that we would consider is launching a location that was bilingual, and that would be in Spanish. So um, we want to be thought leaders in not only grassroots entrepreneurship, but, but also including parts of our city that don't, that don't necessarily get to be involved with this community. Um, it's our job to do that. So. Um, I think the only way we, can, we would consider that is if we did one in Spanish, um, and we would maybe do that um, out in Olathe or something like that. But for right now, the low-hanging fruit is how do we just get more of those people involved with what we're doing? So we've actually um, been in discussions with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to partner with them and uh, like nationally to try and drive more um, more participation from that community. And we want to continue to do that, so. Next question to your right here. Hey, Nate. I, hey. Uh, how are you? Good. You did a great job. And I, uh, one, want to uh, kind of Stephen Colbert tip a hat and give a high five to everyone from the people that brew the coffee at Kaufman <laughs> to uh, your staff in providing great energy and great karma at Kaufman and then bringing it here. Uh, wonderful stuff. I participated in uh, Global Entrepreneur Week and this kind of dovetails into what you just said. How can we as people that are getting energy from what we're seeing presented open up our Rolodexes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, George and John run businesses you know, that take real time, um, that has a real impact on their business. And they've become amazing leaders. They benefited from the program. But my hope is that you guys feel empowered in 2014 to, um, to find your place in, in, in how you want to serve the community. So whether it be meeting with every entrepreneur or making introductions where necessary or starting a new group, um, or you know, solving the problem that, that you want solved, that you feel empowered to do that. Like you don't need permission. Um, we have, I love this word, Brad Feld talks about creating a doertocracy, right? We need to create a doertocracy in the city and there's more people now than ever being leaders and trying to help startups, but we need everyone in this room to find their role in some way. You know, One Million Cups is really a metaphor for how to build community that this event would be a catalyst until next week where we do it again. And in between that time period, you guys would go have additional cups of coffee that you would build relationships. And the multiplier effect of having 200 people in the room that when I get done talking, yapping, you guys are all gonna talk, you're highly caffeinated, that, <laughs> that, that multiplier effect is, is exponential. That you know, if we really could count all the cups of coffee, which we've tried, longer story. It's really hard to do unless you're a mathematician. Um, but really, we're, we're making a million different collisions in this city. And I know that all the businesses that have presented at One Million Cups 
have benefited from that. So open up your Rolodex, find your place in this community, let us know how we can help you, um, and then go to town. Nate, question here in the back. Uh, first of all, Nate, uh, great presentation. Uh, you're setting a great example for young entrepreneurs and young uh, business people here in Kansas City. Uh, being a young entrepreneur myself, one of the biggest problems I've noticed is a generational gap between inexperienced entrepreneurs and people who are already successful and kind of functioning in the business world. Uh, I was wondering if you had any ideas or maybe uh, suggestions of how we can maybe work to engage the young and student entrepreneurs you know, more effectively. And maybe if there's any way that One Million Cups can help engage this uh, new generation of entrepreneur entrepreneurs. Yeah, I had this cool idea the other day um, at the Hispanic Chamber. Actually, Edgar, where's Edgar? Edgar's daughter goes to the Art Institute. Um, amazing school for design. They do logos, they do, I mean, they do everything. It's really cool. And I was like, there's a couple hundred students that would be perfect for early stage startups. Working at the Art Institute, like a mile from here. And there's like 200 plus student ventures working here at UMKC. But largely those schools are they're bubbles, right? They're not like convening. So what mechanism do we need to build to get students over there? Because I'm sure you need graphic design, web design. You need all those, all the tool sets that they have, all the skills that they have. How do you get entrepreneurs really working together? Tom Boozer and I have been talking about this idea that business schools don't have class on Friday. What? <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I went to business school. It was awesome. But uh, <laughs> not having class on Friday is nice. But uh, in the same breath, I would say, how do we make Friday the best day of the week on universities all over the country? How do we make this place the place to be all, you know, like all across campus? How do we get computer engineering students, you know, philosophy students over at Rockhurst? How do we get, you know, design students from our institute bust over here and working in this phenomenal building, you know? So I think there's a lot of things that we can do, but it's manpower, you know? Um, I can't, I honestly cannot take on any more stuff than what I'm doing right now. That's just me being honest. And sometimes I have to say no. So as much as I love that idea, if someone wants to take that idea and run with it, please. Another question. That. <clears throat> Just to add to that, uh, the Kansas City Art Institute is creating a application for uh, interacting and working with their students. Sweet. Next question. So this kind of dovetails on the last question. What do you think about going even younger than college age and going down into the high school students? We have uh, Blue Valley Caps program. We had a great presentation from Boys Grow. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, a potential there, and I know your bandwidth is limited, but um, you have Kaufman Scholars, and uh, so there's definitely a, a youth component to what you're doing at Kaufman. Any ideas yeah. there? Yeah, one of the things that we're doing is creating an internship program for high school and college students that are in our Kaufman Scholars program. Um, so now that we know who the entrepreneurs are, uh, you can do a ton of things with that. So now that we know over 200 startups, I'm sure a lot of you guys would like smart, up and coming um, students to work in your business that would be, you know, probably working for free or, you know, working for a lower wage. And they just want experiences. You know, students want experience. Um, in my degree at Rockhurst, my international business degree, you know how many businesses I interacted with? Zero. You know? Zero. What? That doesn't make any sense. Like, what if we have entrepreneurs, like business students, gen ed, if we could have freshmen, like, Gosh, they came half the time in four years, they would interact with 200 businesses. That means like summers wouldn't be spent lifeguarding at the pool. I lifeguard at the pool, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> but I could have used that time better. I know that there were a couple summers where I was just doing PUD jobs because I didn't have any other options. I didn't know who to reach out to. So if students are coming to a program like this, the, even if they came half the time in a four year program, they would interact with 200 entrepreneurs. So I, I think that's the vision is then it's on them to 
be aggressive. There's only so much hand-holding we can do. But I think creating the infrastructure, like I said, where the two can collide. We've had a lot of high school students coming to One Million Cups now on field trips, which is kind of cool. So we're at 10 o'clock, which means what can we do to help, I guess, ourselves? <laughs> I don't, I don't know how else to put it, but um, what do you need, man? Okay, personal thing. A hug every once in a while will go a long <laughs> way. I'm not kidding. Sometimes, like, I'm not married, you know? Like, it's like, I go home and, like, I bitch to my roommates who, like, don't get it, you know? Like, you guys understand what it's like to try and, like, when you don't know your elbow from your ass and you're trying to figure things out. That's just, that's just it. So. Um, so, so just encouragement. Um, also encouraging our community organizers. They give a lot of time, you guys, and um, I, I know they make it look easy and fun, but uh, they do give a lot of time. Um, also, like I said, like, let us know. I'm going to put it up there. What will you create in our community in 2014? Like, John and George have served their leadership time. They've done an amazing job. And the only way that our community is going to continue to grow is if we have fresh people with fresh ideas and a lot of energy to uh, create more leaders. So I think that's how we'll create a more dynamic and diverse startup community. And then share your ideas. Share your ideas with people. Go have lots of coffees. Um, let me know how I can help. And also your feedback is huge, right? Like feedback hurts, but feedback is, is you can actually turn that into actionable items and you can actually create a much better product. So if something's not working or if you want to see something changed here, I mean, I don't know what One Million Cups is going to look like in 2015. You know, like maybe we'll outgrow our purpose. Maybe that looks different. Um, so share your ideas because we're going to have to continue to reinvent. And other than that, I just want to say thank you. I'm extremely grateful to do the work that I do. And uh, you guys have really supported me. The fact that, um, that I get to be a servant leader is um, really humbling. So thank you. I'm really grateful for this experience and for all of you. So we're, we're way out. We're way out of time, so um, and we've got announcements here, but we're going to make, we actually have one other thing real quick. So it is John and I's last, uh, last day as far as being leadership. We'll definitely still be in the audience and still be participating as much as we can, um, but we're excited and we just want to say thank you to Nate and the crew and it's been a blast. These, it's become much more than like co-leaders, but we're really good friends and we really enjoy spending time together, so it really has been bittersweet to, to move on. But in the course of doing that, we do want to, before the break, real quickly, uh, just want to have Jason and Brian come up. And uh, we want to introduce you to the next um, group of leaders, or two leaders that are going to be replacing uh, John and I. Uh, oh, he's telling me to move this way. Oh, it sounds better here. Um, so Jason and Brian, we, we are really blessed to, um, to invite into the community and um, you're going to be seeing their face for hopefully the next year as they serve alongside Melissa and Mike and Nate and the whole crew. And uh, as much as you can, come up here, give them a warm welcome to One Million Cups in the community. And um, if you have any questions, and I'm, I, I am just going to go ahead and wrap it up because we're out of time. If you have any questions... Um, for them and want to learn more about what their businesses are because remember they're volunteers they have their own businesses and they are working and volunteering this time so as much as you can and you guys have done this for john and i lift them up on your shoulder and help c carry them over this next year as they serve you as in their community so let's give them a warm welcome wait wait wait, wait. one it's it what we have, we have one last thing we want to do for you guys. We call this the passing of the mug. <laughs> All right, Melissa, go ahead. So um, we just have a little gift for them. It's a picture of the One Million Cups family. And uh, 
There's a surprise in there if you can find it. Um, but anyways, we love you guys, and they've been huge servants um, to this community. So thank you again for everything. And, and they're going to see us around, and they're, they're going to be advisors over the next year. So that's that. And then John. Yeah, John, can you wrap us up? Thank you. Well, first, hey, Nate. Oh. Speaking of passing the mug, there's a Rainier coffee cup for you and for Landon for presenting today, and I hope you display this proudly at William Jewell College. <laughs> okay. Take a moment, please, to talk to the faculty. Again, faculty and staff do like this. Find these guys, talk to them about what we're about. A lot of the things that you brought up, John Ruiz's question about, you know, how can we integrate student entrepreneurs in this? We've uh, scheduled no classes to interfere with million cups in spring. No <laughs> classes interfere with it. Um, we are happy to broadcast here locally uh, to candle overflow. When you fill up that room that will hold, what, 200 people, we can hold another 200 here. Happy to do it. So uh, uh, we, we try to work with uh, Kaufman to the extent that we can. We think that together we make a pretty good one-two punch in this part of town. Uh, but talk to our staff and talk about some of the programs that are out here. Uh, please engage with us as well uh, in the entrepreneurial effort, uh, the educational effort. Our goal is to inspire and nurture the next generation of uh, Ewing, Miriam Kaufman's and Henry Block's, and that's what we want to do. Thanks a lot, guys. Huh? See the building. To the building.